Caden Green is coming home to Missouri, and Eli Drinkwitz goes into Arkansas and steals a four-star receiver, plus some thoughts on Drew Locke's big night on Monday Night Football coming up on this early National Signing Day edition of Locked on Mizzou. You are Locked on Mizzou, your daily podcast on the Missouri Tigers, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, all you true sons and daughters, I'm John Miller, your Mizzou mafioso and the central scrutinizer of Missouri Tigers football and basketball. And you know what? We got lots to get to on the program today. And since it is National Signing Day, the early version of National Signing Day anyway here in 2023, well, there could be some breaking news as we go along here in the show, so definitely stay tuned until the very end. That would be my strong recommendation anyway, because lots of exciting stuff happening once again for Missouri football. I think some people expected it yesterday, but hey, a day late, definitely not a dollar short as Caden Green the former Oklahoma Sooners offensive lineman, has committed to the Missouri Tigers. He played last season at Oklahoma, played quite well by all accounts at left guard for the Sooners after playing over 500 snaps as a true freshman, gave up just 12 pressures on the season and no sacks, according to Pro Football Focus. Now, of course, we're expecting that Green is going to move to the outside from left guard to left tackle this coming season. Javon Foster has been a stalwart at that position, a, a cornerstone, a pillar, whatever you want to call him for at least three seasons now at Missouri. And that was one of the biggest needs for Missouri in this offseason. And to be able to, to plug in a guy like Caden Green is pretty unbelievable, really. I mean, it's almost hard for me to wrap my mind around it because in a previous world, well, Missouri would have probably had to rely on a younger player without much experience to, to be ready to step in next season, whoever that might be. Well, in this new world, now you're getting a guy with a lot of experience, even though Caden Green, obviously a very young player, but a guy who could play at Oklahoma and very well as a true freshman, that kind of shows you what kind of prospect he is. And to that point, everybody around Oklahoma, it sounds like, was stunned by this development. So this is just a massive, massive victory on every possible level for Eli Drinkwitz and the Missouri Tigers for the 2024 season, which, as I've said and, and many others have now said as well, I think it's it's playoff not not playoff or bust. That's that's too far. But let's just say it absolutely should be Missouri's goal next season to make the college football playoff, the very first 12-team college football playoff. But, by the way, speaking of Lee Summit North, where Caden Green played his high school football, well, a couple of his former teammates, Armand Mimbu, of course, will be the right tackle starting almost certainly next year for the Missouri Tigers on the opposite side of Caden Green. But Williams Winery also the big-time high school prospect, also from Lee Summit North, another former teammate of Caden Green. So, again, I don't know exactly what went all into Caden Green's decision to transfer and specifically to Missouri. I'm assuming that perhaps the, the opportunity to move back to left tackle where he played in high school, that may have been a draw, but I've got to think just having those former teammates around may have been something as well. I got to think Brandon Jones is certainly impressing a lot of people with his coaching ability on that offensive line as well, because I'll tell you, there was a take that I really agreed with by, by John Williams, my colleague over at Locked On Sooners, basically just talking about offensive lines and how difficult it is to recruit that particular position. Well, he's talking about the Sooners offensive line coach, Bill Bendenbaugh. And he says offensive line evaluations are tough and few people really grasp what to look for when scouting offensive linemen. Trust the guy that puts dudes 
in the league. And to that point, Bill Bendenbaugh, the Oklahoma offensive line coach, he's put as many guys into the National Football League at that position as I can think of. Of any program, when it comes to linemen, I think the Sooners have been second to none in the past decade or so here. So again, for Caden Green to make this decision, that shows a lot of trust in Missouri. The program, the offensive line coach, just everything about it. And when it comes to name, image, and likeness, there's no doubt that Missouri is very highly competitive in that space. But I'm pretty sure Oklahoma's got some pretty good name, image, and likeness packages as well. So I I think this speaks so much more to just being, well, the highest bidder kind of thing. Obviously, NIL is going to be a factor in all of these recruitments. But I think a lot of this just speaks to a lot of proof of concept here. I think Caden Green and his family, from all reports, really liked Missouri coming out of the high school process, but you know, just liked Oklahoma a little bit better and easier to trust the Sooners, right, to be a major big-time school that's going to win a lot of games and put your son into the NFL. Well, again, more proof of concept this past season with a 10-2 and real breakout season for the Tigers and, hey, hopefully a, a Cotton Bowl victory here in a little more than a week as well. Now on the offensive line, Missouri has three starters coming back next season. Missouri will be without, as I said already, Javon Foster at left tackle. But also next to him at left guard, Xavier Delgado will be gone as well. And I suppose Caden Green could play at left guard too, in theory, right? It's where he played at Oklahoma last season, so not exactly a, a stretch to think that. Again, I'm just assuming that Caden Green is going to play left tackle, but perhaps considering if you factor in how this could all play out, the the transfer portal process here, if there's another really strong tackle in the market, well, perhaps they talk to Caden Green and say, are you still willing to play guard? If you're, are you just willing to be one of the best five guys? I don't know how important it is for him to play tackle or not. I really don't. It seems like traditionally, of course, In the NFL, your tackles have made more guaranteed money more often than not, but it seems like as time goes along here, interior linemen are getting paid closer to what tackles used to back in the day. It seems like that's that's sort of evened out a little bit over time. So I just don't know how important that is to Caden Green, but regardless, Missouri going to be looking for a left guard, possibly possibly another tackle, but I think you're looking another, once Missouri finds one more interior lineman in the portal, they're probably set there, at least they feel like they are. And on the high school side of things for recruiting, well, things are really picking up for Missouri there as well. I talked yesterday about Kawan Lacey, the running back who Missouri basically swooped in at the last the last second, the 72nd hour, and essentially stole him from Lane Kiffin and the Ole Miss Rebels. So that was that was fun, right? Let's keep that kind of thing up, especially today. Another swoop in. Maybe not as much at the last second. This one was a bit of a surprise, but another young man, a four-star receiver who had committed, been committed to his home state of Arkansas, the Razorbacks for quite some time, but Eli Drinkwitz and company with another recruiting win today. So I want to tell you about Courtney Crutchfield coming up here in just a little bit. But first, let's talk about how passion, drive, and patience are what brings home the winning trophy and also what keeps your ride-or-die vehicle alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into power, speed, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. 
Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit. Only available to U.S. customers. Thanks for making Locked On Mizzou your first listen every day. For your second listen, check out Locked On Sports today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. That's Locked On Sports today. And today, Missouri has been moving up the high school recruiting rankings quite a bit. I'm looking at 24-7 sports right now. The Tigers now 24th just behind North Carolina and ahead of Wisconsin and Kentucky in those rankings. Of course, a couple big flips have helped Missouri rise up in those rankings pretty significantly from the 30s, as I said before, running back Kawan Lacey, but also Arkansas, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, I should say, four-star receiver Courtney Crutchfield. No relation, by the way, to my buddy, Mr. Shiz. For those of you who like to have a good laugh back in the day, maybe a decade or so with Tiger football. If you if you remember Mr. Shea's good memory. But anywho, moving on. But Courtney Crutchfield looks like a heck of a prospect. 6'3", 175 or so. And a guy that, again, most of your future casts over at Rivals.com, the vast majority, had him as a hog lock as the phrase often goes. But no, Missouri swoops in at the end, and Eli Drinkwitz, no no, no stranger to throwing a little shade when, when he's feeling himself and feeling the glow of victory. Well, Eli Drinkwitz put out a tweet with a gif of him fist-pumping in the Arkansas game in the CBS graphic, fading in, saying 41 Missouri, Arkansas nothing. So, Wow, Eli Drinkwitz, not afraid of a little smack talk. You got to love it, to be honest with you. But honestly, that's a pretty big blow to Arkansas and a really big win for Missouri, a team that obviously Missouri, it seems like, is going to play annually from here on forward, even in this new SEC schedule with 16 teams that's going to be starting in 2024. And speaking of 2024, there's obviously many more names out there to be watching in terms of the transfer portal. I'm not going to break them all down for you here, but maybe the biggest one I'm watching is Florida defensive lineman Chris McClellan. It sounds like the Tigers are in pretty good shape with him, but once again, the Oklahoma Sooners are a suitor there. Colorado and Coach Prime in on this young man as well, but again, a, a defensive lineman for Missouri pass rusher and interior I think going to be a priority on that defense as well as linebacker too and by the way a few days ago maybe even a week ago now at this point Eli Drinkwitz was talking with a a St. Louis radio host named Frank Cusimano and was saying hey expect within a couple days that Kirby Moore, Missouri's offensive coordinator, and Blake Baker, Missouri's defensive coordinator, expect an announcement about some contract extensions for them in the next couple of days or so. Well, a couple of days has definitely come and gone, and yet we have no official announcements for either Kirby Moore or Blake Baker just yet. Now, I can't say I'm worried, but... I'm a little interested. Let's put it that way. I will say I wouldn't worry too much about Kirby Moore looking at other offensive coordinator jobs. I've seen his name pop up as an opera as a possibility at Notre Dame, for instance, as an offensive coordinator. But just logically looking at it, I just can't see why Kirby Moore would make a what is basically a lateral move at offensive coordinator at this point. Now, you might be saying, what are you talking about? Notre Dame's one of the blue blood programs in college football history. Well, at this point, folks, there's just not as much of a difference between the blue bloods and the teams like Missouri, who are maybe just a level under that as there used to be. We saw it, I think, this past season. I think you're seeing it once again in this offseason with the transfer portal. This is this is evening out a lot of talent, I think, at the Power 5 level. Now, maybe at the Group of 5 level, at lower levels than that, yeah, they're maybe getting pillaged and they may not like this situation very much. 
But but for teams like Missouri, who are, again, in the big-time conferences, who aren't traditional powers, well, this has to all be good for those teams. Especially, again, good timing for Missouri, having a 10-2 and breakout season at, at really about as much of a perfect moment as you possibly could have. So, again, I just don't think if you're Kirby Moore, you're looking at an offensive coordinator gig at Notre Dame as much of an upgrade in terms of money, in terms of the potential talent that you're going to be coaching, especially in 2024. I think we all expect this to be a really good team, and in particular a really good offense that, once again, is going to be competing for a spot in the college football playoff. You could say much the same thing about Notre Dame next season. I'm sure that'll be their goal, too. They're going to be saying, hey, we want to make the college football playoff. I get it. Again, at this point, there just isn't as much of a difference between Notre Dame and Missouri as there used to be. Now, if you're talking about head coaching jobs, that's a whole other deal. And I think if anything, if there's a little bit of a delay here on an official announcement of some type of extension for either one, perhaps there are some jobs out there that they might be interested if they if they happen to come open. It seems like in terms of timing, it's a little bit late in the process for that, but I'm just saying in general, I'm not worried about either one of those guys leaving for a similar job. I just don't think that's going to happen whatsoever, even if on paper Notre Dame is still a marginally more attractive job than Missouri. I just don't think it's enough to uproot yourself from what is already an obviously really good situation for Kirby Moore and Missouri. And with Missouri ready to take on Illinois here on Friday night in the bragging rights game in basketball, just a, just a quick hoops note that I thought was really interesting, put out by Tom Orff on X, the Missouri stat guru, if you will. Well, I thought it was interesting. Of course, we remember last season, Kobe Brown's incredible performance in St. Louis, taking down the Illini, maybe the best moment of his career at Missouri, quite honestly, scored 31 points in the game, tying the all-time Missouri high for a Tiger against the Illini, tying him with none other than Norm Stewart for 30 with 31 points against the fighting Illini. I just thought that was an incredible note for those guys who are basically 70 years apart in terms of age and their time playing basketball for the Tigers. But I don't know. I just thought that was a great bit of connective tissue there between a guy who's 22 and a a guy who is 92 for all intents and purposes in Norm Stewart there. Just thought that was a really cool and interesting note and just shows you that Norm Stewart is a Missouri legend that is just never going to be matched for as incredible as somebody like Kobe Brown is, you know, it's tough to compete with the guy who not only he's got, he's tied your, your scoring record against Illinois, but also the great greatest basketball coach in co in history and a pitcher on the, on the national championship baseball team too. Good luck to anybody trying to match that particular feat by Norm Stewart. By the way, a quick correction there, Norm Stewart, not 92, as I assume there. I was just doing some fuzzy math. Norm, 88 years old, at least according to qu- to a quick Wikipedia search. Kobe, 23, so only 65 years of difference there, as opposed to, well, the 70 that I was assuming. But darn it, the 70 made my point a little better, don't you think? But regardless, speaking of another point I'd like to make, Drew Locke with a heck of a performance last night on Monday Night Football. In particular, that game-winning touchdown pass had to feel good for a guy who's taken a lot of crap in his NFL career and a guy who's been really patient the last couple years waiting to get back on the field. So you know what? I want to talk about Drew and why, to me, he's an example of just why it's so hard to evaluate the quarterback position in general. So let's talk about Drew coming up right after these quick words. Well, as Missouri fans, I think all of us who are watching Monday Night Football last night felt great for Drew Locke because he just seems like a great guy, doesn't he? The post-game interview there with Lisa Salters, you know, she she asked him at one point, Drew, seems like you're you're getting hear a little emotion in your voice. And 
he said, yeah, it's just been a been a long time waiting, that long time coming, that kind of thing. And, you know, just as an aside, by the way, I, I actually thought Lisa Salters handled that about as well as I've seen anybody in that position handle it. She she addressed that sort of part of the thing. But as so so often I see these sideline reporters in that moment try to try to make it the Oprah Winfrey show or something and try to make the guy cry more or something like that. But she quickly got back to, you know, just asking him a football question, that kind of deal. And I, anyway, I just thought she handled that really well, just as an aside there. But again, it wasn't just that interview you saw after that touchdown pass to win the game there for the Seahawks right at the end of the game the, to Jackson Smith and Jigma with about, what, 25 or 30 seconds left there. I believe in the ball game, Drew Locke does his signature celebration there that we saw back in the, the Texas Bowl, I believe, days when, what does he do? He, he puts on the backpack or secures the bag, what, whatever the heck he does. I'm too old. I don't know what the kids do these days. But all I know is Geno Smith, it was pretty cool to see the, the usual Seahawks starter give it back to him. And you could tell Geno Smith was really happy for Drew Locke and by the way, another post-game interview there, Drew Locke talked to the, the Spanish broadcast as well. And during that exchange with the, the sideline reporter there on the Spanish broadcast, well, Albert Okuebunam came over and, and got Drew's attention. Drew said real quickly, hey, I'm sorry, man, just give me one second. They dapped up and hugged for, for just a few seconds there, and Drew came back to the interviewer and who asked him, hey, who was that? And and Drew said, well, that's actually it's my best friend. That's Albert Okwebunam. We played at Missouri, and we played together with the Denver Broncos as well. So just cool to see Albert O, who was not suited up for the ball game for the Philadelphia Eagles, but was on the sidelines, of course. was cool to just see, after all those years, those guys still just have tremendous love for each other. I don't know. As a Mizzou fan, it almost makes you tear up. It really does. But seriously, it just shows how freaking difficult it is to be a quarterback, especially in the NFL. For all the talk of, you know, average quarterback play this season in the league and how seemingly evaluators and draft nicks and all these people just really aren't getting all that much better at selecting quarterbacks. I think the problem is it's just so incredibly difficult to play that position. To me, there are three major elements of what it takes to be a great NFL quarterback, and Drew Locke actually has two of the three. But unfortunately, he doesn't have, in my opinion, the most important one. To me, Drew Locke has all of the, the charisma and leadership abilities you could possibly want. That's why I brought up the Albert Okuebenam stuff, the stuff with Geno Smith, and just his obvious charisma that he displayed in, in that postgame and just likability in general. If you don't think that stuff matters, it absolutely does. I, I think at that position in particular, I think leadership qualities mean a tremendous amount. Now, it doesn't mean anything if you don't have the arm, and that's obviously the second element. There's at least a minimum amount of arm talent that you've got to have to be a, a great in the National Football League. And Drew Locke certainly has the arm. That's never been a question. So two out of three, hey, we've got it so far. But unfortunately, and again, I hate to bring up negativity here after Drew Locke just had a great game, but I'm making a separate point here. The reason Drew Locke is maybe not ever lived up to his arm talent and, and his leadership capabilities is for whatever reason, I just don't think he's ever been able to anticipate throws and, and break down defenses and whatever that, that sort of intangible quality is that frankly, Chase Daniel always had in his career, especially at the college level at Missouri, we saw it over and over and over again. I think he had it at the NFL level too, by the way, we just didn't get it, get him get to see it very much because he was a career backup. But again, to my point about how hard it is at this position, again, not an indictment of Drew Locke because guess what? Chase Daniel only had two of the three elements as well. He just had different ones than Drew Locke. You see, Daniel had the leadership, and he had what Drew Locke doesn't, doesn't have, in my opinion. He had that sort of innate ability to just see what was happening before it happened see the play quickly develop and get the ball to where it needed to be. But unfortunately, Chase Daniel really didn't have enough arm strength to be a, a true starter at the NFL level. 
I fought that notion as a big time Chase Daniel fan for years and thought, no, he should be a starter. Somebody should give him a shot. Well, unfortunately, I think when we saw the last few years, when we saw Daniel get his shots as a starter, he had his moments without a doubt, but I think the longer he played, those physical limitations began to rear their ugly head at what is just an incredibly high athletic level and a hyper-competitive NFL football world. Again, nothing against either one of those guys. You could say the same thing about Blaine Gabbert and Drew Locke. Again, all three of these guys I'm talking about are incredible success stories. They've made millions of dollars throwing a ball, okay? That's called success, ladies and gentlemen. That's exactly what it looks like. So I would trade spots with all three of those guys right now, believe you me. So this is not anything on them. It's just an example of how freaking hard it is to play quarterback in the NFL. So that makes it even better when somebody like Drew Locke has a moment like that. So thank you all so much for spending a few moments with me today on the podcast. Of course, give me lots more to talk about here this week. Signings in high school, transfer portal, the whole deal, bragging rights, cotton bowl. Hey, keep it locked right here to Locked on Mizzou.